Good afternoon, Brother Wayne Chown. It is uh, my honor. Uh, after such a long wait to do this interview. Well, 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 the honor is mine. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to uh, look at ancient future. The reason for looking at that is that I think it holds the keys to understanding where we are today. Mm -hmm. It gives us insight to, uh, into seasons and how the principles of the universe kind of work in terms of a, a cyclical movement. Uh, it's African philosophy. But um, I'd like for you to kind of give us some insight. I'd like for you to introduce yourself and just tell us a little, little bit about your background. Uh, yeah, um, my name is Wayne Chandler. Uh, I've been a student of just various sciences really since 1970. Uh, that's when I began my journey, and I began that journey with uh, endeavors into yoga. Um, being into yoga uh, for a little while, I began to uncover different types of, of information that led to a um, a very revolutionary, as, as I thought, um, perspective with respect to an African influence, you know, in in the uh, the yogic science, which led me to the work of uh, individuals such as uh, Rumoko Rashidi and uh, others that that just really had delve pretty deeply into the African influence in many of the uh, Asian-based cu cultures and civilizations. Uh, and that started, my, that started my journey with respect to really uncovering a lot of, you know, the contributions or influences that African people had on Asian-based culture and civilization, and not only just their presence there, but how they actually develop many uh, powerful and profound systems that were in sync with universal order and that were very revealing, you know, about the uh, direction, you know, that humanity would take based on different cycles. Um, so that started. Uh, my journey, I, I wrote for uh, Ivan Van Sertima for about 10 years, and then uh, working with him, you know, he was definitely uh, a mentor to me and was able to, to give me different insights and perspectives with respect to, you know, how you lecture, how you write, you know, what are the best ways, you know, to deliver information so that no one can refute what it is, you know, that you're saying. Um, I learned all of that from Ivan, and I've studied with uh, several um, so-called masters on the planet, you know, that, that deal with uh, energy, energetic repatterning, you know, such a system such as Qigong. Uh, I have a background in, in medical Qigong. Um, I'm a practitioner of that. I'm a practitioner also of, of uh, energetic repatterning as taught through uh, individuals such as Minka DeVos and Montak Chia, um, who are some of the tops, you know, in this particular field of endeavor. And uh, put a lot of time into uh, the practice of yoga, you know, in my earlier years. Uh, it's something that over the last decade I've gotten out of somewhat, you know, but uh, prior to that, um, yoga was really my center, you know, and so I combined, you know, the sciences with great enthusiasm knowing that yoga was developed and, and basically, uh, you know, created by, you know, the, uh, the, the genius of, um, of, of black people coming out of uh, a very early time in India that we identify now as the Indus Valley Civilization. So even though yoga has, has you know, been looked at its genesis with respect to the Patanjali manuscripts, 
yoga, you know, as a science and a discipline, you know, relating to the transformation of consciousness dates back, you know, all the way to, and these are conservative dates, to at least uh, five, seven thousand BCE, you know, with the Indus Valley civilization, which, you know, were black people. Now, how important is it for African people really to study and to understand that they are the uh, progenitors of, uh, of, of these sciences? Um, I'm, I'm doing an interview, I'm calling you back. I think, um, Hello? I think it's very important. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's essential. But the thing that uh, is even more important and more essential is, is how we approach that information. You know, it, it's a very uh, comprehensive and extensive body of knowledge. And so you want to approach it holistically, which means you don't want to go in and compartmentalize different aspects you know, that uh, are befitting or comfortable, you know, for, for just your presentation, you know, or your uh, delving into a certain body of information. If you're going to present this information, you know, to, uh, to black people, you know, as, as a scholar, you know, as, as a, uh, you know, a, um, individual, you know, who, who is, has, has taken up, you know, a, uh, a quest, you know, to disseminate, you know, this level of information, then you, it, it's kind of your responsibility to really look at that holistically, you know, so that you're not just talking about the fact that black people were here and that black people were there, you know, and, 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 and the type of buildings, you know, and, and monuments that they created you know, and, and constructed, you also want to look at the foundation, the core, you know, of that, of that civilization because what allowed them to do what they did, you know, was their internal cultivation, you know, was the cultivation of their consciousness. That's what allowed them, you know, to create what we now identify as the wonders of the world. And they're the wonders because we're not at that level of consciousness where we can even begin to comprehend what it is and how they did what they did. You know, so I think one of the things that we really come up short with is identifying the core, the spiritual core, that ethos, you know, that lies at the hub of all of these black cultures and civilizations that allowed them to do what we consider the amazing you know, undescribable things that they eventually did. Now, you, you, you mentioned the word consciousness. Um, and so you, you are saying essentially that knowledge raises one's consciousness. It's, how would you interpret that so that we can get the impact for, for, for understanding the importance of understanding our history? Yeah, knowledge, you know, raises consciousness, but proper holistic knowledge raises consciousness in a very holistic manner. So it doesn't just stop, you know, with the acquisition of, of certain bodies of information. It transcends that. It goes into the actual practicing of doing specific things, which literally repattern and, and, and shapeshift you as an individual, you as a human being. And this was one of the, uh, the features, you know, of our ancient, you know, uh, cultural um, and, 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 and uh, civilized uh, um, journey, you know, in, in antiquity was, was that they had a very profound system in place that was about transcendental information. In other words, it really allowed them to repattern themselves energetically and step into a place and a time reflecting their inner being and their inner direction 
that was very, very substantial as it was uh, connected and integral to nature and the universe. And we don't have that. We don't approach, you know, we just, our approach and understanding today of knowledge and information is, is very uh, superficial at best. You know, we like to talk about where black people were here and black people were there and black people did this and that, but we don't approach it from the standpoint of a, of a practical sense of doing so that we can actually look into these various systems and begin to work with these systems. But so many other individuals, so many other cultures, so many other civilizations have um, been able to do that. You know, they've been able to take the information from those um, ancient periods and utilize them to fortify and create the necessary foundation of, of, of their own cultural and, civil, and, and uh, directions in civilization. Um, so again, you know, one of the things that I believe very strongly is, is uh, the root of our problem today is that we move without that divine, transcendental, or spiritual connectedness that our ancestors had. It was a part of who and what they were. It was who and what they were. You know, where from us, you know, we have been disconnected. We've been divorced from that deep core aspect of ourselves, you know. And until we get that back, until we get back in contact with that feature of ourselves, you know, then uh, we, have a, we have a big job. Well, people go to school, they graduate from university, they go and get PhDs and the center. Mm -hmm. uh, are you telling me that that's not enough to, uh, well, let me ask you this. Why are we disconnected from ourselves? Whew, that's, there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons. I mean, if you go back and you look at um, the base reason, the base reason has a lot to do with how time and, and space is framed in this particular culture that we exist in. So prior to 45, 44 BCE, all of civilization functioned off of a cyclical calendar. So it understood the movements, you know, of nature and time as a uh, sequential um, and, 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 and very uh, universal construct. But about 44, 45 BCE, you had a calendar which came upon the planet that became known as the Julian calendar, and that it was created and designed by Julius Caesar. Now this calendar was very linear as opposed to being cyclical as the calendars that came before it. So it literally shifted the way we looked at the organization of time. Instead of seeing like a natural format, you know, in, in, in the natural scheme, you know, of, of uh, our own, you know, environmental and universal order of things, everything began to become artificially uh, enhanced. You know, so moving along a linear train of thought, you know, or, or a, a linear uh, path of existence, you know, really moved the whole consciousness of humanity into a very, um, left brain uh, dynamic. So whereas our ancestors use and balanced both hemispheres, you know, of the brain, when we became linear in our thinking, it moved us into just one a aspect or one hemisphere of the brain, which was the left. And the left hemisphere is all about disconnection. The left hemisphere of the brain is all about, you know, the mundane. It's all about that which is tangible. It's all about that which moves through the five senses and only the five senses. 
So when you look at the construct of the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere is the construct of divinity. It's the construct that allows one to enter into the higher realms or the spiritual realms of being. You know, it's transcendental in its essence, in its nature. It deals with connectedness as opposed to compartmentalization as, as the left hemisphere does. So once we were moved out of a balance you know, uh, hemispheric orientation into just looking at one and operating out of one hemisphere, which was the left, which was mundane, then our ability to navigate the right hemisphere and our own spiritual um, undertakings was cut off. We were disconnected from that. So Western culture you know, is, 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 a, is a very mundane, three-dimensionally inspired culture. And so everything that it engages, it's all about illusion. You know, because the left hemisphere is all about illusion. The left hemisphere of the brain is the abode of fear and the ego. So what happens is that you literally begin to acquire vast amounts of information believing that this information, you know, is going to limit you, you know, uh, or really free you from the limitations, you know, um, that have been placed upon you. But the illusion of the left brain or the left hemisphere is that it doesn't matter how much information you acquire, it's all intellectual. It's all an illusion giving you the sense that you have acquired a tool that can liberate you from the construct, the cultural construct that you have bought into, that you have been influenced by, that you have been overwhelmed by. And that's where we live. We live this construct of the more information we acquire, the more it will set us free. But if that was the case, we would be living a totally different reality than the reality that we're living today. You know, we're in survival mode 24-7. We follow the dictates of a culture that lays down a certain recipe for survival and for thriving. But again, it's a left brain recipe. It's a recipe that deals with illusion, and it never ever produces the benefit that it's stated to produce. It never produces, you know, the 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 liberating aspects, you know, that we supposedly, you know, have bought into to acquire. We never acquire those various features of this program that we have bought and have basically that's been given to us. You know, we've been enculturated with a certain system of beliefs and those beliefs lead us to a place where it's a brick wall. There's nothing there. Once you get to the end of this road, that's as far as you can go. You know, so we end up really buying into many distractions which Keep us, uh, keep us sedated, you know? It, it's like a, a mental or psychological inebriation that um, keeps us from really looking in other places for an authentic um, recipe, you know, for change and, and true evolvement and, 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 and uh, true self-empowerment, you know? So we develop and work through what we feel empowerment is just through the ego. And because the ego is based on fear, people don't understand the emotional fields, you know? So the deeper you go into your ego, the deeper you go into fear. Fear and ego share the same bed. 
And that's why when I see an individual who moves primarily from an ego-centered reality, I know that they are very insecure, they're very afraid, and behind closed doors, the closed doors of their own consciousness, they live in fear, you know, consistently. Um, one of the things, uh, an example of that, LeBron James played for Cleveland for many years. I was very happy to see him go because I felt that he wasn't going to be able to acquire what he needed for his own personal journey on this planet at this time. So I was glad to see him go. How he left, he could have done it much better, you know, but he did it the way he did it. But in doing it that way, he like literally incited, you know, a very negative, low base, emotional, you know, uh, field that was national. He became, you know, a, uh, I don't know the, the term, I mean, just demonic in, in the eyes of, 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 of many people, you know, to the point where when he walks into arenas, he's booed from the first moment he steps on the court. This field that was generated, this field of hatred that was generated was so powerful. And you, if, if you understand emotional fields, you are very, very um, influenced by such a, a projection of emotional energy onto your being, onto your body, and the way it permeates your body and your consciousness. So what he had to do, he had to say, screw everybody. I don't give a damn. I'm gonna do my thing. So he had to keep reaching deeper and deeper into his ego to make himself believe that he didn't care how people felt or how people thought. But the deeper he went into his ego, he had to go deeper and deeper into his fear. And so what happened is that those times when he would have to really show up for games, to close a game out, because he was so deeply invested in his ego, he was just as deeply invested in his fear. And so when it came time for him to produce and to come through for his team, it's the fear that showed up. And it's the fear that always made him choke. So until he gets to a place where he understands that he cannot live through the ego and use that as a mechanism to liberate his consciousness and his heart, the fear is always going to limit what he's going to be able to do in terms of a quality athlete. And that's his predicament. So our predicament as a culture is very similar. We live in consistent fear because when you take something that vibrates at a certain level, that has a certain vibrational quality to it, and that quality is reflected in its consciousness, and you're able to go in and rearrange and repattern that entity, you know, and move it out of its natural environment into your environment and get it to subsist off of the various ingredients that you offer it through your environment, then that entity, whatever it is, it has two choices. It will either cease to exist or it will have to adapt and adjust to this new environment. But in adapting to this new environment, it must give up 
very specific things that are essential to its own well-being. And that's what we've done. And what we've given up is our spiritual fortitude. What we've given up is our ability to transcend, you know, three-dimensional constructs and to live in a place, you know, where we are consistently and totally at the mercy of fear and all these other low-based negative emotional fields. And that's what we move through our, our lives with on a daily basis, 24-7. You know, so our challenge in, in this place, in the Western Hemisphere, you know, is, is really um, a challenge of con reconnecting with who and what we are as spiritual beings, as spiritual entities, you know, and being able to utilize that. You know, we're fourth dimensional beings. You know, that's why we're designed in the way that we are energetically, you know, with the different chakras and the different meridians that move life force or energy from one part of our bodies to the other. The chakra system dictates, you know, all of what transpires in the human body, you know, from consciousness, to like just, you know, physical mechanisms, you know, to biochemical mechanisms, you know. So the fact that we don't even acknowledge that these things are real, you know, uh, really puts us um, at, a, at, a, at a place of, of emotional and spiritual deficit, you know, and, and we, we begin, you know, our journey in this place, you know, really uh, at a very powerful and profound disadvantage mm -hmm. because we're not able to connect with the aspects and the essences of who and what we are, what really makes us and gives us the quality of consciousness that we see with our ancestors. Can, can we look at that for a moment? For an example, our ancestors built structures like the pyramids. Um, they brought about really the foundation of all knowledge. And uh, the world lives through and upon that foundation with changes that is presented back to us through the culture of other people. But can you, when you talk about three dimension and four dimension, can you make it real so that we can understand the concrete differences between what we can do in a four dimensional world, uh, mm -hmm. exercising our spirit and our being, and how we are limited in a three dimension? Sure. Living in a fourth dimensional reality, and this was, this was the powerful thing about uh, our adherence, you know, or our ancestors' adherence to a lunar calendar. Because the calendar was created in a way that, you know, you had uh, 13 months, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you had uh, 28 days you know, in, in every month. So nothing ever changed. Now what happens scientifically when you live in such a construct, it frees up the right hemisphere. And it frees up the right hemisphere and allows it to be consistently engaged because the left hemisphere of the brain is all about intellectual pursuit. It's all about, you know, a, a certain level, you know, of, of cognition that um, is, is how you calibrate, you know, your mundane reality. Um, when you live with a program that is consistent from day to day, from month to month and from year to year, you don't have to really worry about time and space. So for example, 
May the 4th falls on a Tuesday. June the 4th is also going to fall on a Tuesday. July the 4th is also going to fall on a Tuesday. It runs consistent, so you don't have to stop and ponder where you are in the schematic of time and the schematic of space. When you stop and think about how much mental energy we spend on wondering what time it is and what we have to do within these limited frames of space that we are given, it keeps us locked and rooted in the left hemisphere or three-dimensional reality. So what our ancestors, because they functioned off of a calendrical system that was consistent and fluid across the board, connected to a natural schematic, they never had to stop and think about all of those things. And they were allowed to like move into much deeper frameworks which reflecting their own inner consciousness because the right hemisphere of their brain was open and, and allowed such, you know, uh, perception and events to take place. We're not patterned like that. So when you are locked into the right hemisphere of the brain, and especially the way the calendar was set up, the calendar was set up in a way, because it was a lunar calendar, it allowed the fourth dimensional framework of who and what we were to be consistently evident in our everyday lives, which meant that all the chakras in our body were active, you know, and what they communicated to the endocrine glands in the body, you know, was consistent. They were downloading information consistently all of the time. From where? From our, the universal sphere as well as our environmental sphere, as well as our earthly sphere, you know, so we were pulling information all of the time. Now, Every human being is encoded with everything that it needs to know. So whatever is known in the universe is known within us. So we have, you know, when you look at DNA, you know, the, the field of genetics, we operate or function off of a double strand, the double helix. That's how we're encoded. But our ancestors functioned with many more strands of DNA than we have at our disposal in this particular day and time, which allowed them to access much more information, a much greater body of information that they are encoded with, you know, and then to actually express and live that particular reality. We don't have that, you know. Um, at this particular point, you know, we, we really operate not too far from the source, you know, of, of what constitutes cro magnon and Neanderthal. The illusion is that we have information, that we have knowledge, but it's only an illusion, you know. We've been able to do specific things but in terms of consciousness, we've really done very little to nothing. Well, people would look at uh, technology. They look at um, uh, weapon systems, for example, the ability to destroy the planet, or at least they think they can, but smart bombs that can, I mean, you know, they just look at the war machine, and that seems so intelligent, uh, at least it seems like a level of intelligence because it has the, the ability to bring nations to their needs. And uh, so we assume that 
this kind of technology represents intelligence and the one who has the greatest acquisition of this technical mm -hmm. knowledge then it is implied that they are the most intelligent and and since we don't have it or at least it doesn't seem that we have that capacity um, it puts us at a grave disadvantage so the question that I'm asking you is how do we gain I, I know that that ultimately you know it, it's it, it's it's a system of intense exercise intense development and consciousness but but, but well let me ask you this and then we'll get to ancient future even though we've been talking about it. Uh, what is it that black folk African people today what is it that we have done a need to do that will put us on the right path in terms of looking at uh, we were talking yesterday and you said the greatest thing the black man has done is to blame the European what you mean well everything is about consciousness that's where it begins that's where it ends you know everything else is is a distraction it's all about consciousness so everything that moves from the field of consciousness should move in a way that's going to empower and enlighten the individual if that's not happening then it's a downward spiral the universe recognizes two things it recognizes growth it recognizes demise or death those are two programs that are always in operation there is no middle ground so you're either growing or you're dying one or the other so consciousness is about moving someone into an upward spiral that gives them a much greater understanding of life the quality of life and connectedness to all things when you talk about what we as a people have to do or need to do the first thing and this is what I had said last night the first thing that we need to do is stop giving away our power because through consciousness we have blamed other people for putting us in this position there's an attachment there's an emotional attachment to that that is very stifling and once you create such a profound emotional attachment you know to that thought which occupies your consciousness because of the power implied in that you really get to a place where you become non-functional you know you become non-representative and you actually begin you know to move into a place of uh, inertia where you're not really active in your process you're not active in the process of developing growing expanding evolving you know so when I say that when one gives up their power and we do that to the European you know because we blame them for our current situation we blame them because we don't have enough money we blame them because we're just existing and not thriving we blame them you know because you know we, we, we're not able you know to get the kind of uh, <laughs> cars that we want you know so the blame is 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 multifaceted and it's continuous and it occupies a variety of different levels and those levels move from the more mundane level of consciousness into literally creating a a uh, a stalwart between your spiritual consciousness and your ability to manifest because once you activate your spiritual consciousness and once you move into your fourth dimensional self 
then you are more easily able to manipulate this three-dimensional construct and the reality that is a part of it. And that is our birthright. But that is something that we have no clue as to how to do, let alone that such a process or procedure even exist. You know, so what we like to do is literally pull from the culture all the various ingredients that the culture provides for us. So the culture has guns. It has varieties of different weapons. So we want to get guns and we want to get other weapons that we feel are going to protect us, you know, from, you know, the culture and the weapons that it has. That's a joke. You will never, ever be able to have as many guns as these people have. And you will never be able to have the sophisticated weaponry outside of guns that these people have. Never. Why? Because you're in their house. And believe me, everything that happens in their house, they are very much aware of. The other thing is that the level of, of um, just uh, technology, you know, that you have to gain access to because they have biological weaponry, you know. They have, they have weapons that we would believe to be based in science fiction. You know, they have weapons that are sound based where they can send out various vibrational frequencies, you know, and completely destroy different types and forms of organic life. They've been able to determine the life-based vibrational frequency of different entities and train, you know, a, a vibrational uh, frequency upon that, that particular life form and whoosh, take it out of living space. They've been able to do that. They've been able to do that, you know, they, almost 15, 20 years ago, they were doing that with viruses. They were able, they, they're able to like look at a virus, identify its vibrational life-based signature, and use a frequency to shoot into that particular virus and destroy it. You have a whole tech, you have life, life technology which is based on that. Life technology is based on using vibrational frequency to go into the body and alleviate all types of disorders by understanding the vibrational frequency that is calibrated by that particular imbalance. And then reestablish balance and vibrational integrity. Now, if that is accessible to the public, you can only begin to imagine what the uh, military industrial complex has at its disposal. They've been doing these things for a very long period of time. So the fact that we would even begin to have access to the level of technology, you know, or, or instruments, you know, of, of warfare that they do is a pipe dream at best. Well, <laughs> Wayne, once I listen to what you just said, then it's no wonder that I suffer from hypertension, frustration, uh, fear, uh, and uh, a thousand other ailments because you just laid out a scenario where I don't have any control over my ability to defeat or uh, to get out of this box that I am, at least it appears, physically. Yeah, and that's the key word. The key word is box because that's where we operate within. That's our perspective, you know, is living within the box that has been designed for us to live in. So, in other words, in order for you to get the kind of information to create the kind of process 
that is really going to be of great benefit to you, you have to step out of the box. And that's what it's about. Um, you know, one of the things I talked about last night was like you have, you know, uh, upper level universities now, such as Harvard, that are implementing programs using all of these different techniques, you know, that inspire and activate higher levels of consciousness. It's all about transcendence because they understand that once the mind is open to a field of, of various possibilities, and those possibilities can be understood through the consciousness of that individual, then that individual becomes a master player in the game. And that individual can organize and direct, you know, on, on you know, a, a multifaceted level, many different types of systems. You know, so all these programs are now being introduced into these universities, the Harvard Business School, the Harvard uh, Educational School. You know, they're all learning. These individuals that are going to be placed in very strategic positions dealing with finance, dealing with learning, they will also have the ability to manipulate and shape shift people in categories that they feel these people are designed to be in. And they will have an amazing amount of wherewithal reflecting the type of consciousness that they carry to pull that off. Aren't these the same people that are in control of, of these systems of death? Would this not mean that they have additional systems of control? Then where does that leave us? It will. <laughs> it leaves us longing, you know, to try to find a way to reconnect to that which we truly are and not that which we've been told that we are. If you look up the word artificial and artifact, it basically says, you know, something that is man-made, you know, something designed by man. When you look at who and what we are as human beings, that's the signature that we carry. You know, we are artifacts because we are artificial, because we have been completely divorced from our divine self. So we carry the nature not of the divine, we carry the nature and the various cultural ingredients of the individuals that have created the culture and the ingredients that we have partaken. So, in order for us to really thrive and to develop a process, you know, that will allow us to move out of, you know, this, this field of, you know, uh, degradation and lack, you know, we have to step out of the box. It's a, it's, it's a must. It's essential. That, then, I think is sufficient to, to look at ancient future. Uh, can you hold that book up mm -hmm. so I can get it on, 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 on the camel? Ancient future. Uh, Brother Chandler. Yes. What inspired you to write that book, and what was you're trying to get to us uh, when you wrote that book? When I, when I wrote Ancient Future, um, a lot of that was, was all about what, I, what, I, what we've been talking about, you know, because I, I looked around and I really didn't see um, a body of information that was being disseminated, you know, through uh, our community that was giving us the whys and the hows, you know, because as historians, we're taught to approach history very compartmentalized, you know, to express more of a, a left brain um, perspective, you know, which 
is Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. And that's how we approach our history. What I wanted to do was to look at our history holistically and to literally show how things evolved, developed, and how they can be shifted and changed. You know, what are the bigger players, you know, in terms of our cyclic um, influences? You know, in terms of like, well, people say it all the time, well, what time is it? Well, exactly, what time is it? And what is that time frame significant of? You know, are we put upon, you know, by just this particular uh, culture, you know, that we have been um, subjected to? Or is there a larger process at work that literally feeds their ability to maintain a certain level of control and power over us? And so when you get into the different yugas or the different ages, you find that every age, and there are four, every age has a very specific um, vibrational frequency. It has a very specific characteristic. And the characteristic of the age that we're in now, um, the Igbo referred to it as, as the Uga Azi, and the, uh, the blacks of ancient India referred to it as the Kali, or the Kali Yuga, the age of darkness. You know, but they both, both cultures carry the same interpretation of the various uh, characteristics of this age. You know, that it is an age of profound limitation. It is an age of profound, you know, uh, confusion, an age of um, warfare, an age of being in totally, you know, uh, embattled and, and, you know, just uh, disconnected from any type of uh, spiritual belief system you know, that is authentic, that allows a person to maintain a certain level of divine or universal empowerment. So when I wrote Ancient Future, you know, it was like looking at these different principles, you know, that ancestors left that again have been used, you know, throughout various cultures civilizations, you know, over the last several thousand years. But for our ancestors, it was a rites of passage, you know, because it gave them the how and the why. You know, everyone that comes to this planet needs to know why they're here. From a personal perspective, you're not here to serve somebody else. That's ridiculous. How can you as an individual come here that's connected to a divine program that's all about the evolvement and the spiritual connectedness of self be here to primarily serve someone else that's not even connected to you in any way, shape, form, or fashion in the sense of your own personal empowerment and development. So, you know, what, what ancient future, you know, looks at and establishes is, is the need to embrace these principles, understand these principles, how these principles work in our life on a daily basis, and how we can utilize these principles to really, in this case or scenario, to free ourselves, you know, from the, uh, the limiting belief system that we live in from day to day. Uh.